Let's bring in retired U.S. Navy SEAL Mike Sorelli. You know, Mike, over the weekend, President Biden talked about and, and warned that occupation of Gaza would be problematic. Uh, and I read a Gaza-based political analyst who told the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. stayed in Afghanistan for 20 years. Did it end the Taliban? No. The whole world fought ISIS. Is it finished? Maybe an organization, but they still live on. How do you eradicate an enemy without occupying a territory? I think if history proves anything, uh, that's very difficult to do. However, I wouldn't put it past uh, the IDF and, and the Israeli people to find a way to systematically eliminate Hamas, which needs to be done. Again, for me, this goes back to if we simply let this go, if Israel does not respond, again, they're incentivizing their adversaries to conduct further attacks. You know, Mike, the Israeli army, the IDF, has said not to be within two and a half miles of the northern border there because you have that threat from Hezbollah. Do you believe that's precautionary or do you believe it's anticipatory, perhaps, of, Hama of Hezbollah entering this fray? I think it's a bit of both. So one, the one thing the IDF is doing, and they've been highly effective with the leaflet campaign. Uh, I think estimations from what I've seen are about one million Palestinians have fled the, uh, the north. IDF follows the I'm sorry, international humanitarian laws and two of those pillars are to safeguard human life and then distinction, the distinction between combatants and non-combatants, which is what Israel's trying to do. If they enter the region, they want to re remove as many human shields from Hamas, which is proven to use their people as human shields. They embed their, their weapon cache caches and missiles in hospitals and schools. And if they are struck by Israel, they're the first ones to use that as propaganda against the entire Arab world. Mike, final question for you here. You talk about the humanitarian efforts on the part of the Israeli government to abide by the laws of war. But my question is this, you know, part of that is saying evacuate, get out civilians, and of course, Egypt not being willing to take people in. But, but how do you abide by the laws of war when you have an international body like the United Nations, this is their spokesperson, saying the UN strongly appeals any such evacuation order if confirmed to be rescinded to avoid what could uh, turn into what is a tragedy in a calamitous situation. When you have an international body saying, don't do the evacuation order, but you're desperately trying to get civilians out of the way, how do you do your job at abiding by the laws of war? The UN is usually out of touch of any situation. Uh, and, and that was a sort of a tone deaf uh, sort of response. Let me say this, uh, Hamas is also blocking people from leaving the region. Uh, now, again, this goes back to we lost more Jews on one day since the Holocaust. This has to be uh, addressed. Israel has to respond. There's over 200 hostages being held in the region. And until they are recovered, then Israel needs to go in and, again, systematically exterminate Hamas, identify where the hostages are, and rescue as many as they can. Mike Sorelli, thank you very much. You know, Joey, there's been warnings from our David Harden in the New York Times. Israel could be walking into a trap. An enemy as smart as Hamas who waged this attack, um, really defying all intelligence capabilities, you would think, probably was prepared for step two and probably has laid a trap. Uh, tactically, it's absolutely a trap. Uh, what will probably happen is if they invade, uh, if they invade Gaza, they'll go in slowly with, with what's called a deliberate sweep. They'll be looking for IEDs, any type of landmines, things like that. They'll have armored vehicles, something probably what you call combat engineers that go in and help find things, blow them in place, keep moving. It won't be a bunch of people on foot with rifles right away. Um, but with that deliberate sweep, what you'll have is they'll draw them into city squares and, and alleys and places and then be able to attack them from all sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so tactically, it's absolutely a trap. I think what you're talking about strategically from the world stage, are they walking into a trap in the sense of are they going to kill innocents, trying to retaliate, and then have the world look at them uh, and frown upon them? I don't know who has their heads in the clouds about this, but war is the worst thing in the world, and the price of war is innocent blood. I've seen it myself. I had a nine-year-old girl fall out of a tree onto an IED. It was an Afghan girl, fell out of a tree onto an IED. Obviously, it killed her. We had to go in and be a part of recovering her remains, make sure there weren't other IEDs around. If the Taliban can convince them that her falling on their bomb was our fault, then how are they not convincing the Palestinians that Israeli bombs killing innocent people is Israel's fault? Um, that is the nature of this war. And the idea that Biden would say, uh, you can go in and do this, but you really, shouldn't, uh, you really shouldn't try to occupy. One, there is a perspective there of we tried it and we were terrible at it. But the other side of it is, 
With every bomb that falls in Gaza, there's a new generation of Hamas being born in the hearts and minds of Palestinians that know nothing other than Israel is trying to kill me, whether that's true or not. The idea that this is going to be a short war of any kind, you go and kill everyone that fights for Hamas today, they'll have a different name in 20 years, just like when we fought Muj or when the uh, Soviets fought the Mujahideen and they became the Taliban. So this is a long war, whether they want it to be or not, to have any type of security or God forbid, you know, cohabitation with the people, uh, the Palestinian people. Yeah, and make no mistake, Harris, Hamas doesn't care about children, Palestinian children. They use them as shields. They're blocking them from exiting. Well, absolutely. I mean, you've got more than a million people estimated on the roads right now. And, and we showed some live video outside of a hospital in Gaza last hour. And I made the point, they're, they're going there for supplies, too. I mean, yes, they may be hurt, they may be ill, they may be wounded. But some of them are going for fresh water and things. Hamas has not been just an incompetent fake government. They've been killers of their own people by not feeding them and turning on or making any electrical grids. Uh, it, it is more than shameful what they've done to their own people. It is criminal what they've done. And I do want to say this. The fact that Yemen and others might be called upon by Iran should frighten every American in this country today. The threats from the terrorists there, we are fighting them our part is not proxy anymore. Iran's part is proxy. On June 8th of 2022, the Biden administration confirmed that the U.S. military had been deployed and is conducting operations in Yemen. We're there. Our men and women are there. And it isn't whether or not somebody hits us here. There are people as valiant and as, and as brave as the man sitting next to me on the ground there in Yemen. Our men and women are serving there. So you've got places where we are exposed to Iran's buddies. They don't have to go all the way to Israel to kill us. Yeah, you know, and Morgan, one thing that I think has been left out of the conversation is Netanyahu's attempt to maintain some sort of status quo. He allowed 20,000 work permits for people to travel from Gaza into Israel to work. He allowed Qatar to send aid to provide an econ economic incentives. He has tried to make this work, but how do you make it work with someone who wants you not to exist. Uh, that's right. And, and that is the big difference whenever you have conversations with the Prime Minister Netanyahu or with anybody in the government of Israel about a two-state solution, which, by the way, I would remind everyone that in the Trump administration, under Jared Kushner's peace plan, it was the first time that a Prime Minister of Israel had agreed to a two-state solution. That was during the Trump administration. Guess who did not come to the table to negotiate for that two-state solution? It wasn't Israel. It was the Palestinians. And to echo what Joey was just saying, there's no clean way to wage war. I mean, you do this as, as carefully as you can. And from the American perspective, we look and, and, and we are very careful about trying to avoid civilian casualties. But look at World War II. You know, uh, Japanese and European cities were destroyed. It took years for us to destroy the physical caliphate of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Cities were destroyed in that process. Lives were lost. Uh, but it's not a war that we asked for, and it's certainly not a war that Israel asked for. So you can look at it from a military perspective, from a diplomatic perspective. Uh, whenever we hear, oh, these people are just fighting for their freedom, they just want their land, have any one of them ever said that they believe in the right to the Jewish state to exist. No. They, they chant things. They chant phrases. Yeah. And by the way, some members of Congress don't believe in the Jewish right to exist either, the ones that refuse to condemn Hamas. So it's hard to negotiate with people that want you dead under all circumstances. Right. And it absolutely. And it is hard, Emily, to avert civilian casualties when, as Mark Levin has been saying over and over, the Arab neighbors are not opening their doors. The left is saying, hey, we need to talk about refugees from Gaza in our country. What about the Arab neighbors? Of course, aid being held up right now in Egypt. We know that Syria played a big part in receiving ammunition from Iran. The whole point to me is that all of these are intersecting factors and none of which are in any way mutually exclusive. Morgan, I would love your continued insight onto the fact that um, for example, the Iranian foreign minister has said if Israel doesn't stop, quote, the hands of all parties in the region are on the trigger. And you put that against the landscape of Blinken pledging $75 million to the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, which we know that Hamas regularly and continuously co-ops 
for their nefarious purposes. What say you? I'm so glad that you brought up Iran and their threats this morning because it has me boiling. Um, I, I have talked about this for the last week uh, on Fox. Secretary Pompeo has talked about it. We told the Iranians, if you touch the hair on the head of an American, and it doesn't matter if you do it directly or if you do it through your proxies, uh, if, if you touch Americans, there will be consequences to pay. That was our red line. Uh, and the Iranians, Iranians knew that and acted accordingly, especially after we took out Qasem Soleimani. So the fact that you have Iran out here blustering, threatening us, and not afraid of us, ex excuse me, I believe that 30 Americans are dead. I believe at least 14 to 15 Americans are hostage. Uh, take Israel out of this. What is the American response to this? How are we avenging our people that are killed? And it's time to stand up to the Islamic Republic of Iran. As Pompeo said yesterday on Marita Bar Bartiromo's show, they are not 10 feet tall. We can take them on, mm -hmm. and we have in the past. Can I ask a follow-up question, which is that as Secretary Austin testified in front of Congress to the fact that under Biden's administration, Iran's proxies have essentially attacked Americans over 80 times. We've responded Oops. militarily four times. Such a stark contrast contrast to the zero tolerance you just articulated under the Trump administration. What say you to that moving forward? Oh, well, we have to respond to Iran. We cannot let this, these many deaths go. If Hezbollah starts attacking Israel, that will kill more Americans. Uh, Iran uh, finances Hezbollah. They finance Hamas. They are behind all of this, and they want a war. They want a war that wipes out the state of Israel. They say it all the time. When are we going to start believing them? Mm.